Chapter Nineteen of the Purple Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rick Vina. The Purple Land by W. H. Hudson. Chapter Nineteen. Before it had been long dark, we had crossed the range and entered the department of Minas. Nothing happened till towards midnight, when our horses began to be greatly distressed. My companions hoped to reach before morning an estancia, still many leagues distant, where they were known and would be allowed to lie in concealment for a few days till the storm blew over, for usually, shortly after an outbreak has been put down, an indulto, or proclamation of pardon, is issued, after which it is safe for all those who have taken arms against the constituted government to return to their homes. For the time, we were, of course, outlaws, and liable to have our throats cut at any moment. Our poor horses at last became incapable even of a trot, and dismounting, we walked on, leading them by the bridles. About midnight, we approached a water course, the upper part of the Rio Barriga Negra, Black Belly River, and on coming near it, the tinkling of a bell attracted our attention. It is the usual thing for every man in the Banda Oriental to have one mare, called Madrina, in his tropilla, or herd of geldings. The Madrina always carries a bell attached to her neck, and at night her forefeet are usually hobbled to prevent her wandering far from home, for the horses are always very much attached to her and will not leave her. After listening for a few moments, we concluded that the sound came from the bell of a madrina, and that her forefeet were bound, for the tinkle came in violent jerks, as from an animal laboriously hopping along. Proceeding to the spot, we found a tropilla of eleven or twelve dun-colored horses feeding near the river. Driving them very gently towards the bank, where a sharp bend in the stream enabled us to corner them, we set to work catching fresh horses. Fortunately, they were not very shy of strangers, and after we had caught and secured the madrina, they gathered, whinnying round her, and we were not very long in selecting the five best-looking duns in the herd. My friends, I call this stealing, I said, though at that very moment I was engaged in hastily transferring my saddle to the animal I had secured. That is very interesting information, said one of my comrades. A stolen horse will always carry you well, said another. If you cannot steal a horse without compunction, you have not been properly brought up, cried the third. In the Banda Oriental, said the fourth, you are not looked upon as an honest man unless you steal. We then crossed the river and broke into a swift gallop, which we kept up till morning, reaching our destination a little while before sunrise. There was here a fine plantation of trees not far from the house, surrounded by a deep ditch in a cactus hedge, and after we had taken mate and then breakfast at the house, where the people received us very kindly, we proceeded to conceal our horses and ourselves in the plantation. We found a comfortable little grassy hollow, partly shaded with the surrounding trees, and here we spread our rugs, and fatigued with our exertions, soon dropped into a deep sleep, which lasted pretty well 
all day. It was a pleasant day for me, for I had waking intervals during which I experienced that sensation of absolute rest of mind and body, which is so exceedingly sweet after a long period of toil and anxiety. During my waking intervals, I smoked cigarettes and listened to the querulous pipings of a flock of young black-headed siskins flying about from tree to tree after their parents and asking to be fed. Occasionally, the long, clear cry of the ventaveo, a lemon-colored bird with black head and long beak like a kingfisher, rang through the foliage or a flock of pecho amarillos, olive-brown birds with bright yellow vests, would visit the trees and utter their confused chorus of gay notes. I did not think very much about Santa Coloma. Probably he had escaped and was once more a wanderer, disguised in the humble garments of a peasant. But that would be no new experience to him. The bitter bread of expatriation had apparently been his usual food, and his periodical descents upon the country had so far always ended in disaster. He had still an object to live for, but when I remembered Dolores lamenting her lost cause and vanished peace of mind, then, in spite of the bright sunshine flecking the grass, the soft, warm wind fanning my face and whispering in the foliage overhead, and the merry-throated birds that came to visit me. A pang was in my heart, and tears came to my eyes. When evening came, we were all wide awake, and sat till a very late hour round the fire we had made in the hollow, sipping mate and conversing. We were all in a talkative mood that evening, and after the ordinary subjects of Banda Oriental conversation had been exhausted, we drifted into matters extraordinary. Wild creatures of strange appearance and habits, apparitions, and marvelous adventures. The manner in which the Lampa Lagoa captures its prey is very curious, said one of the company named Rivarola, a stout man with an immense, fierce-looking black beard and moustache, but who was very mild-eyed and had a gentle, cooing voice. We had all heard of the Lampa Lagua, a species of boa found in these countries, with a very thick body and extremely sluggish in its motions. It preys on the larger rodents, and captures them, I believe, by following them into their burrows, where they cannot escape from its jaws by running. I will tell you what I once witnessed, for I have never seen a stranger thing, continued Rivarola. Riding one day through a forest, I saw some distance before me a fox sitting on the grass, watching my approach. Suddenly, I saw it spring high up into the air, uttering a great scream of terror, then fall back upon the earth, where it lay for some time growling, struggling, and biting, as if engaged in deadly conflict with some visible enemy. Presently, it began to move away through the wood, but very slowly, and still frantically struggling. It seemed to be getting exhausted, its tail dragged, the mouth foamed, and the tongue hung out, while it still moved on as if drawn by an unseen cord. I followed, going very close to it, but it took no notice of me. Sometimes it dug its claws into the ground, or seized a twig or stalk with its teeth, and it would then remain resting for a few moments till the twig gave away, when it would roll over 
many times on the ground, loudly yelping, but still dragged onwards. Presently I saw in the direction we were going a huge serpent, thick as a man's thigh, its head lifted high above the grass, and motionless as a serpent of stone. Its cavernous, blood-red mouth was gaping wide, and its eyes were fixed on the struggling fox. When about twenty yards from the serpent, the fox began moving very rapidly over the ground, its struggles growing feebler every moment, until it seemed to fly through the air, and in an instant was in the serpent's mouth. Then the reptile dropped its head and began slowly swallowing its prey. And you actually witnessed this yourself, said I. With these eyes, he returned, indicating the orbs in question by pointing at them with the tube of the mate cup he held in his hand. This was the only occasion on which I have actually seen the Lampa Lagua take its prey, but its manner of doing it is well known to everyone from hearsay. You see, it draws an animal towards it by means of its power of suction. Sometimes, when the animal attacked is very strong or very far off, say two thousand yards, the serpent becomes so inflated with the quantity of air inhaled while drawing the victim towards it that it bursts, I suggested, that it is obliged to stop drawing to blow the wind out. When this happens, the animal, finding itself released from the drawing force, instantly sets off at full speed. Vain effort! The serpent has no sooner discharged the accumulated wind with a report like a cannon. No, no, like a musket, I have heard it myself, interrupted Blas Aria, one of the listeners like a musket, then it once more brings its power of suction to bear, and in this manner the contest continues until the victim is finally drawn into the monster's jaws. It is well known that the Lampa Lagua is the strongest of all God's creatures, and that if a man, stripped to the skin, engages one, and conquers it by sheer muscular strength, the serpent's power goes into him, after which he is invincible. I laughed at this fable, and was severely rebuked for my levity. I will tell you the strangest thing that ever befell me, said Blas Aria. I happened to be travelling alone for reasons on the northern frontier. I crossed the river Yaguaron into Brazilian territory, and for all day rode through a great marshy plain, where the reeds were dead and yellow, and the water shrunk into muddy pools. It was a place to make a man grow weary of life. When the sun was going down, and I began to despair of getting to the end of this desolation, I discovered a low hovel made of mud and thatched with rushes. It was about fifteen yards long, with only one small door, and seemed to be uninhabited, for no person answered me when I rode around it, shouting aloud. I heard a grunting and squealing within, and by and by a sow, followed by a litter of young pigs, came out, looked at me, then went in again. I would have ridden on, but my horses were tired. Besides, a great storm with thunder and lightning was coming up and no other shelter appeared in sight. I therefore unsaddled, loosed my horses to feed, and took my gear into the hovel. The room I entered was so small that the sow and her young occupied all the floor. There was, however, another room, and opening the door, which was closed, I went into it, and found that it was very much larger than the first. Also, that it contained a dirty bed made of skins in one corner, 
while on the floor was a heap of ashes and a black pot. There was nothing else except old bones, sticks, and other rubbish littering the floor. Afraid of being caught unawares by the owner of this foul den, and finding nothing to eat in it, I returned to the first room, turned the pigs out of doors, and sat down on my saddle to wait. It was beginning to get dark when a woman, bringing in a bundle of sticks, suddenly appeared at the door. Never, sirs, have I beheld a fouler, more hideous object than this person. Her face was hard, dark, and rough, like the bark of the Nyandubui tree, while her hair, which covered her head and shoulders in a tangled mass, was of a dry, earthy color. Her body was thick and long, yet she looked like a dwarf, for she scarcely had any legs, only enormous knees and feet, and her garments were old, ragged horse rocks, tied around her body with thongs of hide. She stared at me out of a pair of small, black, rat eyes, then, setting down her bundle, asked me what I wanted. I told her I was a tired traveller, and wanted food and shelter. Shelter you can have, food there is none, she said. Then, taking up her sticks, she passed to the inner room, and secured it with a bolt on the inside. She had not inspired me with love, and there was little danger of my attempting to intrude on her there. It was a black, stormy night, and very soon the rain began to fall in torrents. Several times the sow, with her young pigs loudly squealing, came in for shelter, and I was forced to get up and beat them out with my whip. At length, through the mud partition separating the two rooms, I heard the crackling of a fire which the vile woman was lighting, and before long, through the chinks, came the savory smell of roast meat. That surprised me greatly, for I had searched a room and failed to find anything to eat in it. I concluded that she had brought in the meat under her garments, but where she had got it was a mystery. At length I began to doze. There were many sounds in my ear, as of thunder and wind, the pigs grunting at the door, and the crackling of the fire in the hag's room. But by and by, other sounds seemed to mingle with these, voices of several persons talking, laughing, and singing. At length I became wide awake, and found that these voices proceeded from the next room. Some person was playing a guitar and singing, then others were loudly talking and laughing. I tried to peep through the cracks in the door and partition, but could not see through them. High up in the middle of the wall there was one large crack through which I was sure the interior could be seen. So much red firelight streamed through it. I placed my saddle against the partition and all my rugs folded small, one above the other, until I had heaped them as high as my knees. Standing on my toes, on this pile, and carefully clinging to the wall with my fingernails, I managed to bring my eyes to a level with the crack, and peeped through it. The room inside was brightly lighted by a big wood fire, burning at one end, while on the floor a large crimson cloak was spread, on which the people I had heard were sitting with some fruit and bottles of wine before them. There was the foul hag, looking almost as tall, sitting as she had appeared when standing. She was playing on a guitar and singing a ballad in Portuguese. Before her on the cloak lay a tall, well-formed negro woman, wearing only a narrow white cloth round her loins, and broad silver armlets on her round black arms. She was eating a banana, and against her knees, which were drawn up, sat a beautiful girl, about fifteen years old, with a dark, pale face. She was dressed in white, her arms were bare, and round her head she wore a gold band 
keeping back her black hair, which fell unbound on her back. Before her, on his knees on the cloak, was an old man with a face brown and wrinkled as a walnut, and beard white as thistledown. With one of his hands he was holding the girl's arm, and with the other offering her a glass of wine. All this I saw at one glance, and then all of them together turned their eyes up at the crack, as if they knew that someone was watching them. I started back in alarm, and fell with a crash to the ground. Then I heard loud screams of laughter, but I dared not attempt to look in on them again. I took my rugs to the farther side of the room, and sat down to wait for morning. The talking and laughter continued for about two hours, then it gradually died away. The light faded from the chinks, and all was dark and silent. No person came out, and at last, overcome with drowsiness, I fell asleep. It was day when I woke. I rose and walked round the hovel, and finding a crack in the wall, I peered into the hag's room. It looked just as I had seen it the day before. There was the pot and pile of ashes, and in the corner the brutish woman lying asleep in her skins. After that, I got onto my horse and rode away. May I never again have such an experience as I had that night. Something was then said about witchcraft by the others, all looking very solemn. You're very hungry and tired that night, I ventured to remark, and perhaps after the woman locked her door, you went to sleep and dreamed all that about people eating fruit and playing on the guitar. Our horses were tired, and we were flying for our lives yesterday, returned Blass contemptuously. Perhaps it made us dream that we caught five dun horses to carry us. When a person is incredulous, it is useless arguing with him, said Mariano, a small, dark, gray-haired man. I will not tell you a strange adventure I had when I was a young man, but remember, I do not put a blunderbuss to any man's breast to compel him to believe me, for what is, is, and let him that disbelieves shake his head till he shakes it off, and it falls to the ground like a coconut from the tree. After I got married, I sold my horses, and taking all my money, purchased two ox-carts, intending to make my living by carrying freight. One cart I drove myself, and to drive the other I hired a boy whom I called Mula, though that was not the name his godfathers gave him, but because he was stubborn and sullen as a mule. His mother was a poor widow, living near me, and when she heard about the ox-carts, she came to me with her son and said, Neighbor Marianne, for your mother's sake, take my son and teach him to earn his bread, for he is a boy that loves not to do anything. So I took Mula and paid the widow for his services after each journey. When there was no freight to be had, I sometimes went to the lagoons to cut rushes, and loading the carts with them, we would go about the country to sell the rushes to those who required them to thatch their houses. Mula loved not this work. Often when we were all day wading up to our thighs in the water, cutting the rushes down close to their roots, then carrying them in large bundles on our shoulders to land, he would cry, complaining bitterly of his hard lot. Sometimes I thrashed him, for it angered me to see a poor boy so fastidious. Then he would curse me and say that some day he would have his revenge. When I am dead, he often told me, my ghost will come to haunt and terrify you for all the blows you have given me. It's always made me laugh. At last, one day, while crossing a deep stream, swollen with rains, my poor Mula fell down from his perch on the shaft and was swept away by the current into deep water and drowned. 
well sirs about a year after that event i was out in search of a couple of strayed oxen when night overtook me a long distance from home between me and my house there was a range of hills running down to a deep river so close that there was only a narrow passage to get through and for a long distance there was no other opening when i reached the pass i fell into a narrow path with bushes and trees growing on either side here suddenly the figure of a young man stepped out from the trees and stood before me it was all in white poncho chiripa drawers even its boots and wore a broad-brimmed straw hat on its head my horse stood still trembling nor was i less frightened for my hair rose up on my head like bristles on a pig's back and the sweat broke out on my face like raindrops not a word said the figure only it remained standing still with arms folded on its breast preventing me from passing then i cried out in heaven's name who are you and what do you want with mariano montes de oca that you bar his path at this speech it laughed then it said what does my old master not know me i am mula did i not often tell you that some day i should return to pay you out for all the thrashings you gave me ah master mariano you see i have kept my word then it began to laugh again may ten thousand curses light on your head i shouted if you wish for my life mula take it and be for ever damned or else let me pass and go back to satan your master and tell him from me to keep a stricter watch on your movements for why should the stench of purgatory be brought to my nostrils before my time and now hateful ghost what more have you got to say to me at this speech the ghost shouted with laughter slapping its thighs and doubling itself up with mirth at last when it was able to speak it said enough of this fooling mariano i did not intend frightening you so much and it is no great matter if i have laughed a little at you now for you have often made me cry i stopped you because i had something important to say go to my mother and tell her you have seen and spoken with me tell her to pay for another mass for my soul's repose for after that i shall be out of purgatory if she has no money lend her a few dollars for the mass and i will repay you old man in another world this it said and vanished i lifted my whip but needed not to strike my horse for not a bird that has wings could fly faster than he now flew with me on his back no path was before me nor did i know where we were going through rushes and through thickets over burrows of wild animals stones rivers marshes we flew as if all the devils that are on the earth and under it were at our heels and when the horse stopped it was at my own door i stayed not to unsaddle him but cutting the surcingle with my knife left him to shake the saddle off then with the bridle i hammered on the door shouting to my wife to open i heard her fumbling for the tinder box for the love of heaven woman strike no light i cried santa barbara bendita have you seen a ghost she exclaimed opening to me yes i replied rushing in and bolting the door and had you struck a light you would now have been a widow for thus it is sirs the man who after seeing a ghost is confronted with a light immediately drops down dead i made no sceptical remarks and did not even shake my head the circumstances of the encounter were described by mariano with such graphic power and minuteness 
that it was impossible not to believe his story, yet some things in it afterwards struck me as somewhat absurd. That straw hat, for instance, and it also seemed strange that a person of Mullah's disposition should have been so much improved in temper by his sojourn in a warmer place. Talking of ghosts, said Laralde, the other man, but proceeded no further, for I interrupted him. Laralde was a short, broad-shouldered man, with bow legs and bushy grey whiskers. He was called by his familiars Lechuza, Owl, on account of his immense, round, tawny-coloured eyes, which had a tremendous staring power in them. I thought we had had enough of the supernatural by this time. My friend, I said, pardon me for interrupting you, but there will be no sleep for us tonight if we have any more stories about spirits from the other world. Talking of ghosts, resumed Lechuza, without noticing my remark, and this nettled me, so I cut in once more. I protest that we have heard quite enough about them, I said. This conversation was only to be about rare and curious things. Now, visitors from the other world are very common. I put it to you, my friends, have you not all seen more ghosts than Lampalaguas drawing foxes with their breath? I have seen that once only, said Riverola gravely. I have often seen ghosts. The others also confessed to having seen more than one ghost apiece. Lechuza sat inattentive, smoking his cigarette, and when we had all done speaking, began again. Talking of ghosts. Nobody interrupted him this time, though he seemed to expect it, for he made a long, deliberate pause. Talking of ghosts, he repeated, staring around him triumphantly. I once had an encounter with a strange being that was not a ghost. I was a young man then, young and full of the fire, strength, and courage of youth, for what I am now going to relate happened over twenty years ago. I had been playing cards at a friend's house, and left it at midnight to ride to my father's house, a distance of five leagues. I had quarrelled that evening, and left a loser, burning with anger, against the man who had cheated and insulted me, and with whom I was not allowed to fight. Vowing vengeance on him, I rode away at a fast gallop, the night being serene, and almost as light as day, for the moon was at its full. Suddenly I saw before me a huge man sitting on a white horse, which stood perfectly motionless directly in my path. I dashed on till I came near him, then shouted aloud, Out of my path, friend, lest I ride over you, for I was still raging in my heart. Seeing that he took no notice of my words, I dug my spurs into my horse and hurled myself against him. Then, at the very moment my horse struck his with a tremendous shock, I brought down my iron whip-handle with all the force that was in me upon his head. The blow rang as if I had struck upon an anvil, while at the same moment he, without swerving, clutched my cloak with both hands. I could feel that they were bony, hard hands, armed with long, crooked, sharp talons like an eagle's, which pierced through my cloak into my flesh. Dropping my whip, I seized him by the throat, which seemed scaly and hard, between my hands, and thus, locked together in a desperate struggle, we swayed this way and that, each trying to drag the other from his seat till we came down together with a crash upon the earth. In a moment we were disengaged and on our feet. Quick as lightning flashed out his long, sharp weapon, and finding I was too late to draw mine, 
I hurled myself against him, seizing his armed hand in both mine before he could strike. For a few moments he stood still, glaring at me out of a pair of eyes that shone like burning coals. Then, mad with rage, he flung me off my feet and whirled me round and round like a ball in a sling, and finally cast me from him to a distance of a hundred yards, so great was his strength. I was launched with tremendous force into the middle of some thorny bushes, but had no sooner recovered from the shock than out I burst with a yell of rage and charged him again. For you will hardly believe it, sirs, by some strange chance I had carried away his weapon, firmly grasped in my hands. It was a heavy, two-edged dagger, sharp as a needle, and while I grasped the hilt I felt the strength and fury of a thousand fighting men in me. As I advanced he retreated before me, until, seizing the topmost boughs of a great thorny bush, he swung his body to one side and wrenched it out of the earth by the roots. Swinging the bush with the rapidity of a whirlwind round his head, he advanced against me and dealt a blow that would have crushed me had it descended on me, but it fell too far, for I had dodged under it to close with him, and delivered a stab with such power that the long weapon was buried to its hilt in his bosom. He uttered a deafening yell, and at the same moment a torrent of blood spouted forth, scalding my face like boiling water and drenching my clothes through to the skin. For a moment I was blinded, but when I had dashed the blood from my eyes and looked round, he had vanished, horse and all. Then, mounting my horse, I rode home and told everyone what had happened, showing the knife which I still carried in my hand. Next day, all the neighbors gathered at my house and we rode in company to the spot where the fight had taken place. There we found the bush torn up by the roots, and all the earth about it ploughed up where we had fought. The ground was also dyed with blood for several yards round, and where it had fallen the grass was withered up to the roots as if scorched with fire. We also picked up a cluster of hairs, long, wiry, crooked hairs, barbed at the ends like fish hooks, also three or four scales, like fish scales, only rougher and as large as doubloons. The spot where the fight took place is now called La Cañada del Diablo, and I have heard that since that day the devil has never appeared corporeally to fight any man in the Banda Oriental. The Chuse's narrative gave great satisfaction. I said nothing, feeling half stupid with amazement, for the man apparently told it in the full conviction that it was true, while the other listeners appeared to accept every word of it with the most implicit faith. I began to feel very melancholy, for evidently they expected something from me now, and what to tell them I knew not. It went against my conscience to be the only liar amongst these exceedingly voracious Orientals, and so I could not think of inventing anything. My friends, I began at length, I am only a young man, also a native of a country where marvellous things do not often happen so that I can tell you nothing to equal in interest the stories I have heard. I can only relate a little incident which happened to me in my own country before I left it. It is trivial, perhaps, but will lead me to tell you something about London, that great city you have all heard of. Yes, we have heard of London. It is in England, I believe. Tell us your story about London 
said Blass encouragingly. I was very young, only fourteen years old, I continued, flattering myself that my modest introduction had not been ineffective. When one evening I came to London from my home, it was in January, in the middle of winter, and the whole country was white with snow. Pardon me, Captain, said Blass, but you have got the cucumber by the wrong end. We say that January is in summer. Not in my country, where the seasons are reversed, I said. When I rose next morning, it was dark as night, for a black fog had fallen upon the city. A black fog? exclaimed Lechuza. Yes, a black fog that would last all days and make it darker than night, for though the lamps were lighted in the streets, they gave no light. Demons, exclaimed Riverola, there is no water in the bucket. I must go to the well for some, or we shall have none to drink in the night. You might wait till I finish, I said. No, no, Captain, he returned. Go on with your story. We must not be without water. And taking up the bucket, he trudged off. Finding it was going to be dark all day, I continued, I determined to go a little distance away, not out of London, you will understand, but about three leagues from my hotel, to a great hill where I thought the fog would not be so dark, and where there is a palace of glass. A palace of glass, repeated Lechuza, with his immense round eyes fixed sternly on me. Yes, a palace of glass. Is there anything so wonderful in that? Have you any tobacco in your pouch, Mariano? said Blass. Pardon, Captain, for speaking, but the things you are telling require a cigarette, and my pouch is empty. Very well, sirs, perhaps you will now allow me to proceed, I said, beginning to feel rather vexed at these constant interruptions. A palace of glass, large enough to hold all the people in this country. The saints assist us, your tobacco is dry as ashes, Mariano, exclaimed Blas. That is not strange, said the other, for I have had it three days in my pocket. Proceed, Captain. A palace of glass large enough to hold all the people in the world, and then? No, I shall not proceed, I returned, losing my temper. It is plain to see that you do not wish to hear my story. Still, sirs, from motives of courtesy, you might have disguised your want of interest in what I was about to relate, for I have heard it said that the Orientals are a polite people. There you are saying too much, my friend, broke in Lechuza. Remember that we were speaking of actual experiences, not inventing tales of black fogs and glass palaces and men walking on their heads, and I know not what other marvels. Do you know that what I am telling you is untrue? I indignantly asked. Surely, friend, you do not consider us such simple persons in the Banda Oriental as not to know truth from fable. And this from the fellow who had just told us of his tragical encounter with Apollyon, a yarn which quite put Bunyan's narrative in the shade. It was useless talking. My irritation gave place to mirth, and stretching myself out on the grass, I roared with laughter. The more I thought of Lechuza's stern rebuke, the louder I laughed, until I yelled with laughter, slapping my thighs and doubling myself up after the manner of Mariano's hilarious visitor from Purgatory. My companions never smiled. Riverola came back with the bucket of water, and after staring at me for some time said, If the tears which they say always follow laughter come in the same measure, then we shall have to sleep in the wet. This increased my mirth. If the whole country is to be informed of our hiding place, said Blast the timid, we were putting ourselves to an unnecessary trouble 
by running away from San Paolo. Fresh screams of laughter greeted this protest. I once knew a man, said Mariano, who had a most extraordinary laugh. You could hear it a league away. It was so loud. His name was Aniceto, but we called him El Burro on account of his laugh, which sounded like the braying of an ass. Well, sirs, he one day burst out laughing, like the captain here, at nothing at all, and fell down dead. You see, the poor man had aneurysm of the heart. At this I fairly yelled then, feeling quite exhausted. I looked apprehensively at Lechuza, for this important member of the quartet had not yet spoken. With his immense, unspeakably serious eyes fixed on me, he remarked quietly, And this, my friends, is the man who says it is wrong to steal horses. But I was past shrieking now. Even this rich specimen of topsy-turvy Banda Oriental morality only evoked a faint gurgling as I rolled about on the grass, my sides aching, as if I had received a good bruising. End of chapter 19Chapter 20 of The Purple Land. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Chancho Jump in Seattle, Washington. The Purple Land by William Henry Hudson. Chapter 20. Day had just dawned when I rose to join Mariano at the fire he had already kindled to heat the water for his early mate. I did not like the idea of lying there concealed amongst the trees like some hunted animal for an indefinite time. Moreover, I had been advised by Santa Coloma to proceed directly to the Lomas de Roca on the south coast in the event of a defeat, and this now seemed to me the best thing to do. It had been very pleasant lying there, under the greenwood tree, while those voracious stories of hags, lampalaguas, and apparitions had proved highly entertaining. But a long spell, a whole month, perhaps, of that kind of life was not to be thought of. And if I did not get to Roca now, before the rural police were sent to catch runaway rebels, it would perhaps be impossible to do so later on. I determined, therefore, to go my own way, and after drinking bitter mate, I caught and saddled the dun horse. I really had not deserved the severe censure that Chusa had passed on me the previous evening in reference to horse-stealing for I had taken the dun with very little more compunction than one is accustomed to feel in England when borrowing an umbrella on a rainy day. To all people, in all parts of the world, a time comes when to appropriate their neighbor's goods is held not only justifiable, but even meritorious, to Israelites in Egypt, Englishmen under a cloud in their own moist island, and to Orientals running away after a fight. By keeping the dun over thirty hours in my possession, I had acquired a kind of prescriptive right to it, and now began to look on it as my very own. Subsequent experience of his endurance and other good qualities enables me to endorse the Oriental saying that, A stolen horse carries you well. Bidding farewell to my companions in defeat, who had certainly not been frightened out of their imaginations, I rode forth just when it was beginning to grow light. Roads and houses I studiously avoided, traveling on at an easy gallop which took me about ten miles an hour, till noon. Then I rested at a small rancho, where I fed and watered my horse, and recruited my own energies with roast beef and bitter mate. On again till dark. By that time I had covered about forty miles, and began to feel both hungry and tired. I had passed several ranchos and estancia houses, but was shy of seeking entertainment at any of them, and so went farther, only to fare worse. When the brief twilight was darkening to night, I came upon a broad cart track, leading, I suppose, to Montevideo from the eastern part of the country, and, seeing a long, low rancho near it, which I recognized as a pulperia, or store, by the flagstaff planted before it, I resolved to purchase some refreshment for myself, then ride on a mile or two and spend the night under the stars, a safe roof if an airy one. Tying my horse to the gate, I went into the porch-like projection at the end of the rancho, 
which I found divided from the interior by the counter, with its usual grating of thick iron bars to protect the treasures of gin, rum, and comestibles from drunken or quarrelsome customers. As soon as I came into the porch, I began to regret having alighted at the place, for there, standing at the counter, smoking and drinking, were about a dozen very rough-looking men. Unfortunately for me, they had tied their horses under the shadow of a clump of trees some distance from the gate, so that I had missed seeing them on my arrival. Once amongst them, however, my only plan was to disguise my uneasiness, be very polite, get my refreshments, then make my escape as speedily as possible. They stared rather hard at me, but returned my salutation courteously. Then going to a disengaged corner of the counter, I rested my left elbow on it and called for bread, a box of sardines, and a tumbler of wine. If you will join me, senores, the table is spread, said I, but they all declined my invitation with thanks, and I began to eat my bread and sardines. They appeared to be all persons living in the immediate neighborhood, for they addressed each other familiarly, and were conversing about love matters. One of them, however, soon dropped out of the conversation, and edging away from the others, stood a little space apart, leaning against the wall on the side of the porch farthest from me. I began to notice this man very particularly, for it was plain to see that I had excited his interest in an extraordinary manner, and I did not like his scrutiny. He was, without exception, the most murderous-looking villain I have ever had the misfortune to meet. That was the deliberate opinion I came to before I formed a closer acquaintance with him. He was a broad-chested, powerful-looking man of medium height. His hands he kept concealed under the large cloth poncho he wore and he had on a slouch hat that just allowed his eyes to be seen under the rim. They were truculent, yellowish-green eyes that seemed to grow fiery and dim, and fiery again by turns, yet never for a single instant were they averted from my face. His black hair hung to the shoulders, and he also had a bristly mustache, which did not conceal his brutal mouth, nor was there any beard to hide his broad, swarthy jowl. His jaws were the only part of him that had any motion, while he stood there, still as a bronze statue watching me. At intervals he ground his teeth, after which he would slap his lips together two or three times, while a slimy froth, most sickening to see, gathered at the corners of his mouth. Gandara, you are not drinking, said one of the gauchos, turning to him. He shook his head slightly without speaking, or taking his eyes off my face, whereupon the man who had spoken smiled and resumed his conversation with the others. The long, intense, soul-trying scrutiny this brutal wretch had subjected me to came to a very sudden end. Quick as lightning, a long, broad knife flashed out from its concealment under his poncho, and with one cat-like bound he was before me, the point of his horrid weapon touching my poncho just over the pit of my stomach. "'Do not move, rebel,' he said in a husky voice. "'If you move one hair's breadth, that moment you die.' The other men all ceased talking, and looked on with some interest, but did not offer to interfere or make any remark." For one moment I felt as if an electric shock had gone through me, and then instantly I was calm. Never, in fact, have I felt more calm and collected than at that terrible moment. Tis a blessed instinct of self-preservation which nature has provided us with. Feeble, timid men possess it in common with the strong and brave, as weak, persecuted wild animals have it as well as those that are fierce and bloodthirsty. It is the calm which comes without call when death suddenly and unexpectedly rises up to stare us in the face. It tells us that there is one faint chance which a premature attempt to escape, or even a slight agitation, will destroy. I have no wish to move, friend, I said, but I am curious to know why you attack me. Because you are a rebel. I have seen you before. You are one of Santa Coloma's officers. Here you shall stand with this knife touching you till you are arrested, or else with this knife in you here you shall die. You are making a mistake, I said. Neighbors, said he, speaking to the others, but without taking his eyes from my face, will you tie this man hand and foot while I stand before him to prevent him from drawing any weapon he may have concealed under his poncho? We have not come here to arrest travelers, returned one of the men. If he is a rebel, it is no concern of ours. Perhaps you are mistaken, Gandara. No, no, I am not mistaken, he returned. He shall not escape. I saw him at San Paulo with these eyes. When did they ever deceive me? If you refuse to assist me, then go one of you to the alcalde's house and tell him to come without delay, while I keep guard here. 
After a little discussion, one of the men offered to go and inform the alcalde. When he had left, I said, My friend, may I finish my meal? I am hungry, and had just begun to eat when you drew your knife against me. Yes, eat, he said, only keep your hands well up so that I can see them. Perhaps you have a weapon at your waist. I have not, I said, for I am an inoffensive person, and do not require weapons. Tongues were made to lie, he returned, truly enough. If I see you drop your hand lower than the counter, I shall rip you up. We shall then be able to see whether you digest your food or not. I began to eat and sip my wine, still with those brutal eyes on my face and the keen knife point touching my poncho. There was now a ghastly look of horrible excitement on his face, while his teeth-grinding performances became more frequent and the slimy froth dropped continually from the corners of his mouth onto his bosom. I dared not look at the knife, because a terrible impulse to wrest it out of his hands kept rising in me. It was almost too strong to overcome, yet I knew that even the slightest attempt to escape would be fatal to me, for the fellow was evidently thirsty for my blood and only wanted an excuse to run me through. But what, I thought, if he were to grow tired of waiting, and, carried away by his murderous instincts, to plunge his weapon into me? In that case I should die like a dog, without having availed myself of my one chance of escape through overcaution. These thoughts were maddening. Still through it all, I labored to observe an outwardly calm demeanor. My supper was done. I began to feel strangely weak and nervous. My lips grew dry. I was intensely thirsty and longed for more wine, yet dared not take it for fear that in my excited state even a very moderate amount of alcohol might cloud my brain. How long will it take your friend to return with the alcalde? I asked at length. Gandara made no reply. A long time, said one of the men. I, for one, cannot wait till he comes and after that he took his departure. One by one they now began to drop away, till only two men besides Gandara remained in the porch. Still that murderous wretch kept before me like a tiger watching its prey, or rather like a wild boar, gnashing and foaming, and ready to rip up its adversary with horrid tusk. At length I made an appeal to him, for I began to despair of the alcalde coming to deliver me. Friend, I said, if you will allow me to speak, I can convince you that you are mistaken. I am a foreigner, and know nothing about Santa Coloma. No, no, he interrupted, pressing the knife point warningly against my stomach, then suddenly withdrawing it as if about to plunge it into me. I know you are a rebel. If I thought the alcalde were not coming, I would run you through at once and cut your throat afterwards. It is a virtue to kill a Blanco traitor, and if you do not go bound hand and foot from here, then here you must die. What, do you dare to say that I did not see you at San Paulo? That you are not an officer of Santa Coloma? Look, rebel, I will swear on this cross that I saw you there. Suiting the action to the word, he raised the hilt of the weapon to his lips to kiss the guard, which with the handle formed a cross. That pious action was the first slip he had made, and gave the first opportunity that had come to me during all that terrible interview. Before he had ceased speaking, the conviction that my time had come flashed like lightning through my brain. Just as his slimy lips kissed the hilt, my right hand dropped to my side and grasped the handle of my revolver under my poncho. He saw the movement and very quickly recovered the handle of his knife. In another second of time he would have driven the blade through me, but that second was all I now required. Straight from my waist and from under my poncho I fired. His knife fell ringing to the floor. He swerved, then fell back, coming to the ground with a heavy thud. Over his falling body I leaped, and almost before he had touched the ground was several yards away, then, wheeling round, I found the two other men rushing out after me. Back, I shouted, covering the foremost of the two with my revolver. They instantly stood still. We are not following you, friend, said one, but only wish to get out of the place. Back or I fire, I repeated, and then they retreated into the porch. They had stood by unconcerned while their cutthroat comrade, Gandara, was threatening my life, so that I naturally felt angry with them. I sprang upon my horse, but instead of riding away at once, stood for some minutes by the gate watching the two men. They were kneeling by Gandara, one opening his clothes to look for the wound, the other holding a flaring candle over his ashen, corpse-like face. Is he dead? I asked. One of the men looked up and answered, It appears so. Then, I returned, I make you a present of his carcass. After that, digging my spurs into my horse, I galloped away. Some readers might imagine, after what I had related, that my sojourn in the purple land 
had quite brutalized me. I am happy to inform them that it was not so. Whatever a man's individual character may happen to be, he has always a strong inclination in him to reply to an attack in the spirit in which it is made. He does not call the person who playfully ridicules his foibles a whitened sepulchre or an unspeakable scoundrel, and the same principle holds good when it comes to actual physical fighting. If a French gentleman were to call me out, I dare say, I should go to the encounter twirling my mustache, bowing down to the ground, all smiles and compliments, and that I should select my rapier with a pleasant kind of feeling, like that experienced by a satirist about to write a brilliant article while picking out a pen with a suitable nib. On the other hand, if a murderous brute with truculent eyes and gnashing teeth attempts to disembowel me with a butcher's knife, the instinct of self-preservation comes out in all its old original ferocity, inspiring the heart with such implacable fury that after spilling his blood I could spurn his loathsome carcass with my foot. I do not wonder at myself for speaking those savage words. That he was past recall seemed certain, yet not a shade of regret did I feel at his death. Joy at the terrible retribution I had been able to inflict on the murderous wretch was the only emotion I experienced when galloping away into the darkness. Such joy that I could have sung and shouted aloud had it not seemed imprudent to indulge in such expression of feeling. End of chapter 20「Chapter 21 After my terrible adventure, I did not rest badly that night, albeit I slept on an empty stomach, the sardines counting as nothing, and under the vast, void sky, powdered with innumerable stars. And when I proceeded next day on my journey, God's light, as the pious Orientals call the first wave of glory, with which the rising sun floods the world, had never seemed so pleasant to my eyes, nor had earth ever looked fresher or lovelier, with the grass and bushes everywhere hung with starry lace, sparkling with countless dewy gems, which the Iberas had woven overnight. Life seemed very sweet to me on that morning, so softening my heart that when I remembered the murderous wretch who had endangered it, I almost regretted that he was now probably blind and deaf to nature's sweet ministrations. Before noon I came to a large thatched house with clumps of shady trees growing near it, also surrounded with brushwood fences and sheep and cattle enclosures, the blue smoke curling peacefully up from the chimney, and the white gleam of the walls through the shady trees, for this rancho actually boasted a chimney and whitewashed walls, looked exceedingly inviting to my tired eyes. How pleasant a good breakfast, with a long siesta in the shade after it, would be, thought I, but alas, was I not pursued by the awful phantoms of political vengeance? Uncertain whether to call or not, my horse jogged straight on towards the house, for a horse always knows when his rider is in doubt, and never fails at such times to give his advice. It was lucky for me that on this occasion I condescended to take it, I will at all events call for a drink of water, and see what the people are like, I thought, and in a few minutes I was standing at the gate, apparently an object of great interest to half a dozen children, ranging from two to thirteen years old, all staring at me with wide-open eyes. They had dirty faces, 
the smallest one dirty legs also for he or she wore nothing but a small shirt the next in size had a shirt supplemented with a trousers-like garment reaching to the knees and so on progressively up to the biggest boy who wore the cast-off parental toggery and so instead of having too little on was in a sense overdressed i asked this youngster for a can of water to quench my thirst and a stick of fire to light my cigar he ran into the kitchen or living room and by and by came out again without either water or fire papita wishes you to come in to drink mate said he then i dismounted and with the careless air of a blameless non-political person strode into the spacious kitchen where an immense cauldron of fat was boiling over a big fire on the hearth while beside it ladle in hand sat a perspiring greasy-looking woman of about thirty she was engaged in skimming the fat and throwing the scum on the fire which made it blaze with a furious joy and loudly cry out in a crackling voice for more and from head to feet she was literally bathed in grease certainly the most greasy individual i had ever seen it was not easy under the circumstances to tell the colour of her skin but she had fine large juno eyes and her mouth was unmistakably good-humoured as she smiled when returning my salutation her husband sat on the clay floor against the wall his bare feet stretched straight out before him while across his lap lay an immense surcingle twenty inches broad at least of a pure white untanned hide and on it he was laboriously working a design representing an ostrich hunt with threads of black skin he was a short broad-shouldered man with reddish-gray hair stiff bristly whiskers and moustache of the same hue sharp blue eyes and a nose decidedly upturned he wore a red cotton handkerchief tied on his head a blue check shirt and a shawl wound round his body in place of the chiripa usually worn by native peasants he jerked out his buen dia to me in a short quick barking voice and invited me to sit down cold water is bad for the constitution at this hour he said we will drink mate there was such a rough burr-like sound in his speech that i at once concluded he was a foreigner or hailed from some oriental district corresponding to our durham or northumberland thank you i said a mate is always welcome i am an oriental in that respect if in nothing else for i wished every one i met to know that i was not a native right my friend he exclaimed mate is the best thing in this country as for the people they are not worth cursing how can you say such a thing i returned you are a foreigner i suppose but your wife is surely an oriental the juno of the grease pot smiled and threw a ladle full of tallow on the fire to make it roar possibly this was meant for applause he waved his hand deprecatingly the brad all used for his work in it true friend she is he replied women like horned cattle are much the same all the world over they have their value wherever you find them america europe asia we know it i spoke of men you scarcely do women justice la mujer es un angel del cielo i returned quoting the old spanish song he barked out a short little laugh that does very well to sing to a guitar he said talking of guitars spoke the woman addressing me for the first time while we are waiting for the mate perhaps you will sing us a ballad 
the guitar is lying just behind you. Signora, I do not play on it, I answered. An Englishman goes forth into the world without that desire, common to people of other nations, of making himself agreeable to those he may encounter on his way. This is why he does not learn to perform on musical instruments. The little man stared at me, then, deliberately disencumbering himself of surcingle, threads, and implements, he got up, advanced to me, and held out his hand. His grave manner almost made me laugh. Taking his hand in mine, I said, What am I to do with this, my friend? Shake it, he replied. We are countrymen. We then shook hands very vigorously for some time in silence, while his wife looked on with a smile and stirred the fat. Woman, he said, turning to her, leave your grease till tomorrow. Breakfast must be thought of. Is there any mutton in the house? Half a sheep only, she replied. That will do for one meal, said he. Here, Teofilo, run and tell Anselmo to catch two bullets, fat one, mind, to be plucked at once. You may look for half a dozen fresh eggs for your mother to put in the stew. And Felipe, go find Cosme and tell him to saddle the roan pony, to go to the store at once. Now, wife, what is wanted? Rice, sugar, vinegar, oil, raisins, pepper, saffron, salt, cloves, common seed, wine, brandy. Stop one moment, I cried. If you think it necessary to get provisions enough for an army to give me breakfast, I must tell you that I draw the line at brandy. I never touch it in this country. He shook hands with me again. You're right, he said. Always stick to the native drink, wherever you are, even if it is black draught, whiskey in Scotland, and the banda oriental, rum, that's my rule. The place was now in a great commotion, the children saddling ponies, shouting in pursuit of fugitive chickens, and my energetic host ordering his wife about. After the boy was dispatched for the things, and my horse taken care of, we sat for half an hour in the kitchen, sipping mate, and conversing very agreeably. Then my host took me out into his garden behind the house, to be out of his wife's way, while she was engaged, cooking breakfast, and there he began talking in English. Twenty-five years I have been on this continent, said he telling me his history. Eighteen of them in the Banda Oriental. Well, you have not forgotten your language, I said. I suppose you read. Read? What? I would as soon think of wearing trousers. No, no, my friend, never read. Leave politics alone. When people molest you, shoot them. Those are my rules. Edinburgh was my home. Had enough reading when I was a boy. Heard enough psalm singing, saw enough scrubbing and scouring to last me my lifetime. My father was a bookseller in the high street, near the Cowgate, you know. Mother, she was pious. They were all pious. Uncle, a minister, lived with us. That was all worse than purgatory to me. I was educated at the high school, intended for the ministry, ha <laughs> ha. My only pleasure was to get a book of travels in some savage country, skulk into my room, throw off my boots, light a pipe, and lie on the floor reading, locked up from everyone. Sunday is just the same. They called me a sinner, said I was going to the devil fast. It was my nature. They didn't understand, kept on ding-donging in my ears always scrubbing, scouring. You might have eaten your dinner off the floor, always singing psalms, praying, scolding. Couldn't bear it. Ran away at fifteen, and have never heard a word from home since. What happened? I came here, worked, saved, bought land, cattle, married a wife, lived as I like to live, am happy. 
there's my wife mother of six children you've seen her yourself a woman for a man to be proud of no ding-donging black looks scouring from monday to saturday you couldn't eat your dinner off my kitchen floor there are my children six of em all told boys and girls healthy dirty as they like to be happy as the day is long and here am i john carrickfergus don juan all the country over my surname no native can pronounce respected feared loved a man his neighbour can rely on to do him a good turn one who never hesitates about putting a bullet in any vulture wild cat or assassin that crosses his path now you know all an extraordinary history i said but i suppose you teach your children something teach him nothing he returned with emphasis all we think about in the old country are books cleanliness clothes what's good for soul brain stomach and we make a miserable liberty for every one that's my rule dirty children are healthy happy children if a bee stings you in england you clap on fresh dirt to cure the pain here we cure all kinds of pain with dirt if my child is ill i dig up a spadeful of fresh mould and rub it well best remedy out i'm not religious but i remember one miracle the saviour spat on the ground and made mud with the spittle to anoint the eyes of the blind man made him see directly what does that mean common remedy of the country of course he didn't need the clay but followed the custom same as in the other miracles in scotland dirt's wickedness how they reconcile that with scripture i don't say nature mind i say scripture because the bible's the book they swear by though they didn't write it i shall think over what you say about children and the best way to rear them i returned i needn't decide in a hurry as i haven't any yet he barked his short laugh and led me back to the house where the arrangements for breakfast were now completed the children took their meal in the kitchen we had ours in a large cool room adjoining it there was a small table laid with a spotless white cloth and real crockery plates and real knives and forks there were also real glass tumblers bottles of spanish wine and snow-white pan criollo evidently my hostess had made good use of her time she came in immediately after we were seated and i scarcely recognized her for she was not only clean now but good-looking as well with that rich olive colour on her oval face her black hair well arranged and her dark eyes full of tender loving light she was now wearing a white merino dress with a quaint maroon-coloured pattern on it and a white silk kerchief fastened with a gold brooch at her neck it was pleasant to look at her and noticing my admiring glances she blushed when she sat down then laughed the breakfast was excellent roast mutton to begin then a dish of chickens stewed with rice nicely flavoured and coloured with red spanish pimenton a fowl roasted or boiled as we eat them in england is wasted compared with this delicious guiso de porto which one gets in any rancho in the banda orient after the meats we sat for an hour cracking walnuts sipping wine smoking cigarettes and telling amusing stories and i doubt whether there were three happier people in all uruguay that morning than the unscotched scotchman john carrickfergus his unding-donging native wife and their guest who had shot his man on the previous evening 
After breakfast, I spread my poncho on the dry grass under a tree to sleep the siesta. My slumbers lasted a long time, and on waking, I was surprised to find my host and hostess seated on the grass near me, he busy ornamenting his surcingle, she with the mate cup in her hand and a kettle of hot water beside her. She was drying her eyes, I fancied, when I opened mine. Awake at last, cried Don Juan pleasantly. Come and drink mate. Wife just been crying, you see. She made a sign for him to hold his peace. Why not speak of it, Candelaria? he said. Where is the harm? You see, my wife thinks you have been in the wars, a Santa Coloma man running away to save his throat. How much does she make that out? I asked, in some confusion, and very much surprised. How? Don't you know, women? You said nothing about where you had been, prudence. That was one thing. Looked confused when we talked of the revolution. Not a word to say about it. More evidence. Your poncho, lying there, shows two big cuts in it. Torn by thorns, said I. Sword cuts, said she. We were arguing about it when you woke. She guessed rightly, I said, and I am ashamed of myself for not telling you before. But why should your wife cry? Women like. Women like, he answered, waving his hand. Always ready to cry over the beaten one. That is the only politics they know. Did I not say that woman is an angel from heaven, I returned. Then, taking her hand, I kissed it. This is the first time I have kissed a married woman's hand, but the husband of such a wife will know better than to be jealous. Jealous, ha, ha, he laughed. It would have made me prouder if you had kissed her cheek. One, a nice thing to say, exclaimed his wife, slapping his hand tenderly. Then, while we sipped mate, I told them the history of my campaign, finding it necessary, when explaining my motives for joining the rebels, to make some slight deviations from the strictest form of truth. He agreed that my best plan was to go on to Rocha, to wait there for a passport before proceeding to Montevideo, but I was not allowed to leave them that day, and, while we talked over our mate, Candelaria deftly repaired the tell-tale cuts in my poncho. I spent the afternoon making friends with the children, who proved to be very intelligent and amusing little beggars, telling them some nonsensical stories I invented, and listening to their birds nesting, armadillo chasing, and other adventures. Then came a late dinner, after which the children said their prayers and retired. Then we smoked and sang songs without an accompaniment, and I finished a happy day by sinking to sleep in a soft, clean bed. I had announced my intention of leaving at daybreak next morning, and when I woke, finding it already light, I dressed hastily, and going out, found my horse already saddled, standing, with three other saddled horses at the gate. In the kitchen, I found Don Juan, his wife, and the two biggest boys, having their early mate. My host told me that he had been up an hour, and was only waiting to wish me a prosperous journey before going out to gather up his cattle. He at once wished me good-bye, and with his two boys went off, leaving me to partake of poached eggs and coffee, quite an English breakfast. I then rose and thanked the good signora for her hospitality. One moment, she said, when I held out my hand, and drawing a small silk bag from her bosom, she offered it to me. My husband has given me permission to present you with this at parting. 
it is only a small gift but while you are in this trouble and away from all your friends it perhaps might be of use to you i did not wish to take money from her after all the kind treatment i had received and so allowed the purse to lie on my open hand where she had placed it and if i cannot accept it i began then you will hurt me very much she replied could you do that after the kind words you spoke yesterday i could not resist but after putting the purse away took her hand and kissed it good-bye candelaria i said you have made me love your country and repent every harsh word i have ever spoken against it her hand remained in mine she stood smiling and did not seem to think the last word had been spoken yet then seeing her there looking so sweet and loving and remembering the words her husband had spoken the day before i stooped and kissed her cheek and lips i do my friend and god be with you she said i think there were tears in her eyes when i left her but i could not see clearly for mine also had suddenly grown dim and only the day before i had felt amused at the sight of this woman sitting hot and greasy over her work and had called her juno of the grease pot now after an acquaintance of about eighteen hours i had actually kissed her a wife and the mother of six children bidding her adieu with trembling voice and moist eyes i know that i shall never forget those eyes full of sweet pure affection and tender sympathy looking into mine all my life long shall i think of candelaria loving her like a sister could any woman in my own ultra civilized and excessively proper country inspire me with a feeling like that in so short a time i fancy not oh civilization with your million conventions soul and body withering prudishness vain education for the little ones going to church in best black clothes unnatural craving for cleanliness feverish striving after comforts that bring no comfort to the heart are you a mistake altogether candelaria and that genial runaway john carrick fergus make me think so ah yes we are all vainly seeking after happiness in the wrong way it was with us once in ours but we despised it for it was only the old common happiness which nature gives to all her children and we went away from it in search of another grander kind of happiness which some dreamer bacon or another assured us we should find we had only to conquer nature find out her secrets make her our obedient slave then the earth would be eden and every man adam and every woman eve we are still marching bravely on conquering nature but how weary and sad we are getting the old joy in life and gaiety of heart have vanished though we do sometimes pause for a few moments in our long forced march to watch the labours of some pale mechanician seeking after perpetual motion and indulge in a little dry cackling laugh at his expense End of chapter 21chapter twenty two of the purple land this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by rick vena the purple land by w h hudson 
Chapter 22 After leaving John and Candelaria's home of liberty and love, nothing further worth recording happened till I had nearly reached the desired haven of the Lomas de Rocha, a place which I was, after all, never destined to see, except from a great distance. A day unusually brilliant, even for this bright climate, was drawing to a close, it being within about two hours of sunset, when I turned out of my way to ascend a hill with a very long, ridge-like summit, falling away at one end, appearing like the last sierra of a range just where it dies down into the level plain. Only in this instance the range itself did not exist. The solitary hill was covered with short tussocks of yellow, wiry grass, with occasional bushes, while near the summit large slabs of sandstone appeared just above the surface, looking like gravestones in some old village churchyard, with all their inscriptions obliterated by time and weather. From this elevation, which was about a hundred feet above the plain, I wished to survey the country before me, for I was tired and hungry. So was my horse, and I was anxious to find a resting place before night. Before me, the country stretched away in vast undulations towards the ocean, which was not, however, in sight. Not the faintest stain of vapour appeared on the immense crystalline dome of heaven, while the stillness and transparency of the atmosphere seemed almost preternatural. A blue gleam of water, south-east of where I stood, and many leagues distant, I took to be the lake of Rocha. On the western horizon were faint, blue, cloud-like masses with pearly peaks. They were not clouds, however, but the sierras of the range, weirdly named Cuchilla de las Animas, ghost-haunted mountains. At length, like a person who puts his binocular into his pocket and begins to look about him, I recalled my vision from its wanderings over illimitable space to examine the objects close at hand. On the slope of the hill, sixty yards from my standpoint, were some deep green dwarf bushes, each bush looking in that still brilliant sunshine as if it had been hewn out of a block of malachite, and on the pale, purple, solanaceous flowers covering them, some bumblebees were feeding. It was the humming of the bees, coming distinctly to my ears, that first attracted my attention to the bushes, for so still was the atmosphere, that at that distance apart, sixty yards, two persons might have conversed easily, without raising their voices. Much farther down, about two hundred yards from the bushes, a harrier hawk stood on the ground, tearing at something it had captured, feeding in that savage, suspicious manner usual with hawks, with long pauses between the bites. Over the harrier hovered a brown milvago hawk, a vulture-like bird in its habits, that lives by picking up unconsidered trifles. Envious at the other's good fortune, or fearing, perhaps, that not even the crumbs or feathers of the feast were going to be left, it was persecuting the harrier by darting down at intervals with an angry cry and aiming a blow with its wing. The harrier methodically ducked its head each time its tormentor rush down at it, after which it would tear its prey again in its uncomfortable manner. Farther away, in the depression, running along at the foot of the hill, meandered a small stream, so filled with aquatic grasses and plants, that the water was quite concealed, its course appearing like a vivid green snake 
miles long, lying there basking in the sunshine. At the point of the stream nearest to me, an old man was seated on the ground, apparently washing himself, for he was stooping over a little pool of water, while behind him stood his horse with patient, drooping head, occasionally switching off the flies with its tail. A mile farther on stood a dwelling which looked to me like an old estancia house, surrounded by large shade trees growing singly or in irregular clumps it was the only house near but after gazing at it for some time i concluded that it was uninhabited for even at that distance i could see plainly that there were no human beings moving about it no horse or other domestic animal near and there were certainly no hedges or enclosures of any description. Slowly I went down the hill, and to the old man sitting beside the stream. I found him engaged in the seemingly difficult operation of disentangling a luxuriant crop of very long hair, which had somehow, possibly from long neglect, got itself into great confusion. He had dipped his head into the water, and with an old comb, boasting about seven or eight teeth, was laboriously and with infinite patience drawing out the long hairs, a very few at a time. After saluting him, I lit a cigarette, and leaning on the neck of my horse, watched his efforts for some time with profound interest. He toiled away in silence for five or six minutes, then dipped his head in the water again, and while carefully wringing the wet out, he remarked that my horse looked tired. Yes, I replied, so is his rider. Can you tell me who lives in that estancia? My master, he returned laconically. Is he a good-hearted man? one who will give shelter to a stranger i asked he took a very long time to answer me then said he has nothing to say about such matters an invalid i remarked another long pause then he shook his head and tapped his forehead significantly after which he resumed his mermaid task demented said i he elevated an eyebrow and shrugged his shoulders, but said nothing. After a long silence, for I was anxious not to irritate him with too much questioning, I ventured to remark, Well, they will not set the dogs on me, will they? He grinned and said that it was an establishment without dogs. I paid him for his information with a cigarette, which he took very readily and seemed to think smoking a pleasant relief after his disentangling labours. An estancia without dogs, and where the master has nothing to say. That sounds strange, I remarked tentatively, but he puffed on in silence. What is the name of the house, I said, after remounting my horse? It is a house without a name, he replied and after this rather unsatisfactory interview, I left him and slowly went on to the estancia. On approaching the house, I saw that there had formerly been a large plantation behind it, of which only a few dead stumps now remained, the ditches that had enclosed them being now nearly obliterated. The place was ruinous and overgrown with weeds. Dismounting, I led my horse along a narrow path through a perfect wilderness of wild sunflowers, hoarhound, redweed, and thorn-apple, up to some poplar trees where there had once been a gate, of which only two or three broken posts remained, standing in the ground. From the old gate the path ran on, still through weeds, to the door of the house, which was partly of stone, 
and partly of red brick with a very steep sloping tiled roof beside the ruined gate leaning against a post with the hot afternoon sun shining on her uncovered head stood a woman in a rusty black dress she was about twenty-six or twenty-seven years old and had an unutterably weary desponding expression on her face which was colourless as marble except for the purple stains under her large dark eyes she did not move when i approached her but raised her sorrowful eyes to my face apparently feeling little interest in my arrival i took off my hat to salute her and said signora my horse is tired and i am seeking for a resting place can i have shelter under your roof yes caballero why not she returned in a voice even more significant of sorrow than her countenance i thanked her and waited for her to lead the way but she still remained standing before me with eyes cast down and a hesitating troubled look on her face signora i began if a stranger's presence in the house would be inconvenient no no signor it is not that she interrupted quickly then sinking her voice almost to a whisper she said tell me signor have you come from the department of florida have you have you been at san paolo i hesitated a little then answered that i had on which side she asked quickly with a strange eagerness in her voice ah signora i returned why do you ask me only a poor traveller who comes for a night's shelter such a question why perhaps for your good signor remember women are not like men implacable a shelter you shall have signor but it is best that i should know you are right i returned forgive me for not answering you at once i was with santa coloma the rebel she held out her hand to me but before i could take it withdrew it and covering her face began to cry presently recovering herself and turning towards the house she asked me to follow her gestures and tears had told me eloquently enough that she too belonged to the unhappy blanco party have you then lost some relation in this fight signora i asked no signor she replied but if our party had triumphed perhaps deliverance would have come to me ah no i lost my relations long ago all except my father you shall know presently when you see him why our cruel enemies refrained from shedding his blood by that time we had reached the house there had once been a veranda to it but this had long fallen away leaving the walls doors and windows exposed to sun and rain lichen covered the stone walls while in the crevices and over the tiled roof weeds and grass had flourished but this vegetation had died with the summer heats and was now parched and yellow she led me into a spacious room so dimly lighted from the low door and one small window that it seemed quite dark to me coming from the bright sunlight I stood for a few moments trying to accustom my eyes to the gloom while she advancing to the middle of the apartment bent down and spoke to an aged man seated in a leather-bound easy chair papa she said i have brought in a young man a stranger who has asked for shelter under our roof welcome him papa then she straightened herself and passing behind the chair stood leaning on it facing me i wish you good day signor i said advancing with a little hesitation 
there before me sat a tall bent old man wasted almost to a skeleton with a grey desolate face and long hair and beard of a silver whiteness he was wrapped in a light-coloured poncho and wore a black skull-cap on his head when i spoke he leant back in his seat and began scanning my face with strangely fierce eager eyes all the time twisting his long thin fingers together in a nervous excited manner what calixto he exclaimed at length is this the way you come into my presence ha huh, you thought i would not recognize you down down boy on your knees i glanced at his daughter standing behind him she was watching my face anxiously and made a slight inclination with her head taking this as an intimation to obey the old man's commands i went down on my knees and touched my lips to the hand he extended may god give you grace my son he said with tremulous voice then he continued what did you expect to find your old father blind then i would know you amongst a thousand calixto ah my son my son why have you kept away so long stand my son and let me embrace you he rose up tottering from his chair and threw his arm about me then after gazing into my face for some moments deliberately kissed me on both cheeks ah calixto he continued putting his trembling hands upon my shoulders and gazing into my face out of his wild sunken eyes do i need ask where you have been where should a peralta be but in the smoke of the battle in the midst of carnage fighting for the banda oriental i did not complain of your absence calixto demetria will tell you that i was patient through all these years for i knew you would come back to me at last wearing the laurel wreath of victory and i calixto what have i worn sitting here a crown of nettles yes for a hundred years i have worn it you are my witness demetria my daughter that i have worn this crown of stinging nettles for a hundred years he sank back apparently exhausted in his chair and i uttered a sigh of relief thinking the interview was now over but i was mistaken his daughter placed a chair for me at his side sit here senor and talk to my father while i have your horse taken care of she whispered and then quickly glided from the room this was rather hard on me i thought but while whispering those few words she touched my hand lightly and turned her wistful eyes with a grateful look on mine and i was glad for her sake that i had not blundered presently the old man roused himself again and began talking eagerly asking me a hundred wild questions to which i was compelled to reply still trying to keep up the character of the long-lost son just returned victorious from the wars tell me where you have fought and overcome the enemy he exclaimed raising his voice almost to a scream where have they flown from you like chaff before the wind where have you trodden them down under your horse's hoofs name name the places and the battles to me calixto i felt strongly inclined just then to jump up and rush out of the room so trying was this mad conversation to my nerves but i thought of his daughter demetria's white pathetic face and restrained the impulse 
then in sheer desperation i began to talk madly as himself i thought i would make him sick of warlike subjects everywhere i cried we had defeated slaughtered scattered to the four winds of heaven the infamous colorados from the sea to the brazilian frontier we have been victorious with sword lance and bayonet we have stormed and taken every town from taquarembo to montevideo every river from the yaguaron to the uruguay had run red with colorado blood in forests and sierras we had hunted them flying like wild beasts from us we had captured them in thousands only to cut their throats crucify them blow them from guns and tear them limb by limb to pieces with wild horses i was only pouring oil on the blazing fire of his insanity ah he shouted his eyes sparkling while he wildly clutched my arm with his skinny claw-like hands did i not know have i not said it did i not fight for a hundred years wading through blood every day and then at last send you forth to finish the battle and every day our enemies came and shouted in my ears victory victory they told me you were dead calixto that their weapons had pierced you that they had given your flesh to be devoured of wild dogs and i shouted with laughter to hear them i laughed in their faces and clapped my hands and cried out prepare your throats for the sword traitors slaves assassins for a peralta even calixto devoured of wild dogs is coming to execute vengeance what will god not leave one strong arm to strike at the tyrant's breast one peralta in all this land fly miscreants die wretches he has risen from the grave he has come back from hell armed with hell fire to burn your towns to ashes to extirpate you utterly from the earth his thin tremulous voice had risen towards the close of this mad speech to a reedy shriek that rang through the quiet darkening house like the long shrill cry of some waterfowl heard at night in the desolate marshes then he loosened his hold on my arm and dropped back moaning and shivering into his seat his eyes closed his whole frame trembled and he looked like a person just recovering from an epileptic fit then he seemed to sink to sleep it was now getting quite dark for the sun had been down some time and it was with the greatest relief that i saw dona demetria gliding like a ghost into the room she touched me on the arm and whispered come signor he is asleep now i followed her out into the fresh air which had never seemed so fresh before then turning to me she hurriedly whispered remember signor that what you have told me is a secret say not one word of it to any other person here End of chapter 22